Hello, good evening, and welcome to Our Front. My name is Raymond Dalqua. My guest today is an experienced leader. He's known for a remarkably combining professional engineering career with other loves like sports and politics. He has a proven track record in environmental, water, and sanitation management, project management, communication. And later on, you'll get to know if you just see the face, his sports competence and analysis, political risk and analysis, and political organization is very much known. But ultimately, you'll be hearing from him on how to transform this country, which is the ultimate conversation we'll be having on this show, and how to build a new Ghana, usher us into a new era that guarantees prosperity for everybody. Well, I'm glad to have in studio with me, Engineer Kobna Ejeye Japan. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, it's, it's been a while. It's, yes. Uh, I haven't seen you for quite some time. Yes, I have been following keenly your exploits in the Republic. In fact, <laughs> one of the interesting parts I was just telling you about, the very first time I saw you actively engage in partisan politics was when you were contesting as part of, was it 17 or so at yeah, Lagos? 207. Yes, 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 yes. At the time, you were the youngest in that particular group. That's correct. Yes, yes. That's correct. And, That's and correct. I like the expression, Mojamno, we needed Mojamno <laughs> to make sure that things work out in this country. I'm not yes. quite sure that after so many years, you can say Mojamno, but I think I'm, I still am imbued with a lot of vitality. And, it, it shocks me that you don't look... Very much different from the same human being I saw way back then, to be fair. That's the grace of God. Even when you are, as we know from now, I mean, we know that you're over 60, right? Yes. You're just, just 60, yes. Uh, just 10, 60. Um, I don't like to say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, that's an interesting part. It, it, it's, it's almost like you've been around forever. That's right. So very little changes when people see you. They don't connect you with the same age. I'm sure they think that you're still... Yeah, a lot of people the, think I'm 45. I will not dispute that for a second. Um, which mm. is good. So yeah. uh, I, I can connect very well with the youth. Very know. much so. Very much so. Now, I want to start this conversation from something that I... And when anybody who goes through your profile realizes something. For somebody whose father was a lawyer, you, 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 are, you have a science background, rather. That's right. A surprising engineering background. That's right. And I say surprising because, I mean... You would be interested in sports, fine, and other things. But engineering and science mostly was supposed to be the reserve of the quiet and the <laughs> less vociferous, if that's the case. Well, I think I'm reasonably quiet. Really? I'm not very vociferous. And, uh, <laughs> I'm yet to see a press secretary <laughs> or the president who's ever been quiet before. That's but, correct. Mm. Uh, my father really wanted me to be a medical officer. Oh, okay. You know, and he was very disappointed in me that I chose to leave medical school and go to and do civil engineering, mm -hmm. you know, because in infancy from when in sixth form, if you do go to the mass class, okay. then it means that you're going to do engineering, engineering. although okay. you can also do medicine. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, although I got into School of Medical Sciences, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a streak in me that doesn't like dealing with injuries oh, and okay. blood and that kind of All thing. Right. So I opted to go and do civil engineering, which is something that I really wanted because it impacts so much on mm -hmm. the normal lives of human beings. And, and that's what really drove me to become a civil engineer. Even in school, were you, were, you, were you thinking about politics? Because I'm just trying to see where you got a political angle from. Well, yes, in school, because we were in school at the time of the December 80, 31st revolution oh, okay. in 1981. That's mm -hmm. when we were in first year. Okay. And unfortunately, those days, the student movement was hijacked by the so-called leftist communists. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, um, they sided with the revolutionaries. And mm -hmm. I, we suspect that they were even part of the, the, the plot. Oh, I see. And so immediately after the coup, and we were then in, in, in first year. We had mm -hmm. just gone back to school. And then the nukes leadership called out and said, oh, we have to support the revolution. We have to go and evacuate Coco and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then the schools were closed down. The university, there were three universities in Ghana at the time. That's true. And they were closed down, came to Accra, divided into zones. I was sent to Kou to go and oh. carry Coco <laughs> in Kou, Praso and mm. those areas. Uh, you know, but after some time, um, there was a feeling within the student movement that, look, we didn't understand what was going on. We didn't okay. like this. We wanted democracy. Le Mans had just been in office for just over two years. And we didn't think that 31st December uh, coup was justified at all. So there was growing resentment within the student body. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the news leadership used to shift from campus to campus. Oh, okay. I think it was, it leaving, was rotational. It was rotational. It was leaving... Legon and coming to tech. Okay. And uh, we mobilized uh, and made sure that the leftists were thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> and I quite remember the guy who won. 
strangely, he's never been involved in politics. It's called the uh, Amwalabi. Oh, Amwalabi. That's when Damboche became an executive of oh, Nukes. Okay, the Hans, general secretary there. Yes, Hans Jabba, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so that's when really that attempt to remove or that successful move to fight and remove the socialists, I would say, was the very first stint with politics. But then, of course, the unfortunate thing that happened in June 30th, and I know you have worked a lot yes, on that, yes. the, the, the 30th June murders of the three mm -hmm. high court judges. And you know my family suffered uh, that fatality. And, and it, it's ignited a spark in me that I have to do what I can to see the back of military adventurism. And that's what I committed myself to do. While studying, I was determined that whatever we can do to end military dictatorship and adventurism, we have to do it. It didn't deter you, rather. I mean, no, no, it's no, such no. an act will perhaps put pressure on people in to fact, think that at, at this is an area I should never venture no, at into. The time. And even being in public life is not something that I should be at the earning. At the time, some of my siblings, I mean, we could have taken uh, uh, asylum in the UK. I mean, mm. I still have brothers still living in the UK. But oh, I, sure. I refused. I refused to go to the UK. I oh, said wow. I would stay in Ghana and be like a sore thumb um, for the, to be on the conscience of Ghanaians to fight. And Absolutely. ensure that the, the death of my father and his colleagues never be in, in vain. And, and that's what I did. So immediately after I finished university, um, doing my national service at the Ghana Highway Authority as a civil engineer, that's when we got together to, put, to form the Young Executive Forum. Oh. Vibrant, young people who, who supported the MPP, who had mm. liberal views at the time. Would well, you say you were an ideologue right from the beginning? Or you, Not you exactly. Were, you basically had to grow into it. I wouldn't say so. You see, in, in, in student politics, mm -hmm. the, the leftists or the socialists, they were very studious. They were having meetings, they were reading Karl Marx and all the documents. But those of us, we were liberals. Liberals they didn't have time. We were always jamming and having parties, <laughs> okay. and that kind of stuff. Mm. You know, so would say we're liberals. We believed in liberal democracy okay. and that the fact that constitutional uh, rules should be back in Ghana and that kind of stuff. We were not reading mini books. Okay, I, don't, I, don't so. yeah. I, I know my friends who were, who were on the left, uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they used to read a lot of Karl Marx books and all the Machiavelli mm -hmm. and all those stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I brought this in this because, I mean, people develop political ideology over the years and actually it builds into them. When mostly I hear you talk, you seem to appreciate the background and the history of the NPP, not only because you lived it, but because, because you seem to have a certain ideological connection yeah. with the party in such a way that many people don't have that. Right. There are so many people who really... It's important, it's, it's mm. important, uh, Raymond, that right now, if you look at the last census, I mean, young guys, mm. they are in the, in the majority. That's true. I mean, so um, a lot of people are below the age of 40 years. So they really haven't lived the experience That's of true. what Ghana has been through been to true. get where we are. Mm -hmm. And they take it for granted. Yeah. And uh, this did not come cheap. It was a struggle. Mm -hmm. People had to lose their lives. People had to run into exile, die in penury. Businesses were collapsed. So these were very difficult periods for Ghana. And so today, after 30 years of smooth democratic governance, where governments have come and gone Change smoothly. Us, yeah. I think it's something that we have to celebrate. So when I hear some of the young people talk about the want an insurrection and all that, I think I, for one, am duty bound, and many others like me who live through that process, to continue to educate the Ghanaians, to love what we have, and that whatever the shortcomings that we face as a country and as a people, this is 10 times better than military adventurism. Because what happened in the 80s, I'm sure you've covered the National Reconciliation Enough Commission. of that. There's actually. enough of evidence. But sometimes you need to remind the young ones That's true. what we have been through. That's because true. yesterday I was having a meeting with some bloggers, young mm -hmm. people. Okay. You know, and uh, I was a bit worried about their lack of knowledge of contemporary Ghana. Even the history of our country. Even yeah. when I sort to put in the videos I can watch, not necessarily read. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, mm. so it's, it's something that is we, we really have to talk about and I, I need to I want to speak to those who develop the curriculum yeah. for our basic education and even secondary education I don't know whether it's they still do history missing. how can it be that the recent history of Ghana mm. the contemporary history of Ghana from 1957 till now is missing 
How can it be? How can we develop going forward when we don't know where we are coming from? We need not to reside in history, okay. but we need to learn lessons from history so that it can guide our steps going forward. It's a point I wanted to ask you about because, you see, it's been the 1982 abduction and murder That's right. of your father and others, and I'd not seek to remind you of very bad memories, though. Right. But all of that has been 40 years now. 40 now. years. 40, 40 good years. years. For beyond having a bust and doing the things that we say we will do every year to memorialize the people and, and, and put their, them in the proper history that they're supposed to be, that never again that we tell ourselves consistent. Do you think we've learned enough from it? I think so far we can say so. I mean, oh, okay. a, a country like Ghana have to be proud of our record. Okay. And we are respected around the world okay. for having been able to successfully prosecute uh -huh. uh, democratic governance. The what first 35 years of this country was very chaotic. Coups, counter coups people being shot at the stakes, it was really tough. And for those of us who were young in our teens when the 79 coup, you know, happened, yeah. and you, you, know, you relate to people, you know, a lot of their children were our classmates, people, you know, people lost their fathers. So it had a big impact on me. And that's why the politics of the MPP, the way you described it, we, it is a party that was fashioned out of adversity. It got yeah. to a point. It, it, it had to be the, even the, commemoration of the death of the three judges became the rallying point. Yeah. Because at that time, people were scared to do politics. That's and true. the first few times that the Ghana Bar Association tried to organize a memorial service, <laughs> Jerry Rollins and his cadres organized people to disrupt it. But not once, not twice. You know, so it is... Saba Kujoto was telling me barely two weeks ago. That's right. He had to be incarcerated. And that's how I became close to him. Yeah. And uh, Peter Alajete and Nana Kufuado. Because then he became the president of the Ghana Bar. You know, the bar in Accra. And uh, Saba Kujoto was president of the professional bodies. And Peter Alajete was president of the Ghana Bar. And I used to go and visit them. Because I knew they were being vilified for yeah. trying to just... Uh, uh, commemorate the death of my father and his colleagues. And uh, I would go and visit him in his chambers, and I still see him from time to time. And that, that time, if you didn't have the courage to stand up and be counted, you could not even say you were MPP. Mm, so mm, mm. becoming a party... Because it was not fashionable at the time. At all. And there was, there was only one station. There was no yeah. joy effect. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so having access to a media outlet like this mm. one was totally <laughs> impossible. impossible to get. And so, so we, the country has been through a lot. I think we are a lucky generation. Okay. I say so because both politically and even socially, mm -hmm. the kind of transformation that we've lived through, mm. you know, I saw black and white television. I saw yeah. big, what they call ethical, <laughs> ethical yeah. you know, the, the you category know. ones. And I, I, I remember if you wanted to call someone, you had to go to the external department of PNT on the high street, book for four days, and you know those telephones. Before you can make a phone call. Before you can make a phone call. I Today see. I can pick my phone, mm -hmm. WhatsApp, video call. <laughs> and so when people are outside, you don't even miss them anymore. That's because true. you can see them in blood and, in, and mm -hmm. physically. And coming. So there's a lot of good that has happened, happened over the period. to uh, technological advancement. But also there's, it's brought with it its downsides. So it's, it's actually, it's downsides. I get the point. There's a part of this conversation where we'll be talking about where this country goes on from here. That's right. Because that's important too. Yeah. What legacy should your generation should be living for the next generation, looking into the future and the very things that ought to be done. I think but, it's... But yes, I, I'll be asking you that, but the question I want to ask you right now is when you, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know if you heard about it, when you hear the recent cry of Justice Jones Doche, yeah. that um, judges are worried about a possible repeat of what happened in 82, yeah because they feel they are being attacked and that it's uh, becoming problematic. What comes to mind? What's, what surprised me was the, the one who really attacked the judges. And that's uh, former President Mahama, who I know very well, a good friend of mine. And I was surprised because he's been president before. Yeah. You've occupied the highest seat in government. And th therefore, you know what it takes to support the judiciary. Mm -hmm. and, and so for him to come out and say the kinds of things that he said, I find it was a downer. It was disappointing. And you don't need to do that. Whatever the shortcomings, I'm not saying the judges are perfect. They are okay. not perfect. All of us are not perfect. Oh, that's true. Um, we, the leaders, are the ones to provide the maximum support. And having been in the seat as chief executive of state and the first gentleman of the land, 
I think he should be the last person to be running down a critical institution like the judiciary. You understand? So I was really surprised and disappointed that he would make the kind of call that he made. And it was so frontal to even say that you need to replace the chief justice and that kind of yeah. thing. Well, I hope it was in the heat of political talk, which sometimes we politicians do, which I don't really subscribe to because okay. politics is a serious matter. And running the lives of 35 million people projected to be, say, 40 in the next 10 years is a serious matter. And we should stop joking with it. And every comment that we make as political leaders has to be measured, especially to infuse confidence and inspiration for the younger mm -hmm. generation. They are looking on to us. And so that's why I've always advocated against the insults that are dominating the media space. And even sometimes from you, the journalist. Oh, have, I see. Yes, if you have journalists <laughs> sit on national radio and television and use unprintable words against political opponents, even chiefs and all that, it is not good. You, are the, fourth, is this the, you are the fourth estate of the realm. I get your point. Yeah, so we have to be careful. And I remember I said this when I was general secretary, when I, I delivered the remarks at the NDC conference in Kumasi. And I said, look, for the foreseeable future, these two parties, the MPP and the NDC, who were in opposition there, are the ones likely to be governing. So the decorum, the civility, the respect for one another is very good. How we interface with one another how we communicate to the Ghanaian people. We cannot use political expediency to run ourselves down. Because what happens is then, it denigrates politics and the whole political superstructure in the eyes of the Ghanaians. And I'm not surprised that in recent um, surveys, I mean, I've seen quite a number of Afro-barometer Afro surveys, yes. and politics is really down there. We're it? trusting institutions is that, really on an all-time low, actually. That's, that's correct. And this has happened because gradually, and I quite remember in 2007, Asidun Ketia, who had just become general secretary of mm -hmm. the NDC, calling the 17 aspirants yeah, yeah. with very unfortunate yeah, names. Yes, and yes, I said yes, to him, Asidu, don't do this because it's going to come back and bite all, all of, of us. us. And yeah. it's not good. Right now, the confidence that people have in political administration and mm -hmm. in democracy has waned. So we have to work hard to improve that to restore confidence, because that's the best way of ruling ourselves. We cannot allow the chaos of the military dictators. And we just saw what happened in Burkina Faso. Mm. It's just across our border. Yeah. So we can't take things for granted. So the conduct of we as political leaders has to be up there. Our language, uh, the way we speak, the actions that we take when we are in government, it should allow the Ghanaian people to recognize the fact that if it is austerity, then we can get them behind us. Okay, I get your point. Now, I, I miss something, and I consistently complain, even in doing this job. Yes, right. I miss the kind of robust debate by politicians that's mostly on principle, on ideas, and sometimes on policies, without insults, without the other things that really do not add up to anything. You talk about the airways, but it looks like there's a massive decline generally That's in right. the standards of the people that are even in political positions That's true. recently. That is true. My heart bleeds. And I've always said that people should build a career mm -hmm. for themselves before even they get into politics. I think both parties, there are people looking at templates and examples, which for me are the wrong examples. Okay. You have to be, look, I was a young civil engineer working with Ghana Highway Authority. Worked, worked on many projects around this country okay. before I had the opportunity to serve as press secretary to the president. Perhaps By that too young for people to realize that you are not just doing sports presentation. <laughs> yeah, there are some who thought I was a lawyer or yes, a yeah, journalist. Of course. I mean, <laughs> because I've seen I was, the profile of you that says lawyer, sports journalist. And, okay, well, but I, just, I was just not sure of all of the things you have written there. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, because I was combining my work as a civil engineer yeah. with Ghana Highway Authority that's true. and also sitting on national television every Monday to present sports highlights. Mm -hmm. And so people got confused. But that was a passion. I, I loved it. That's and I think my visits to the UK in the early 80s, mm -hmm. during my time as, you know, long vax, I would go there, I would watch the BBC, the ITV, and how they ah, present, how they present <laughs> sports. And uh, mm -hmm. I had a very cooperative uh, sports director in Henry Ako at mm -hmm. GBC. So when I suggest things to him, uh, he, he would Works take out. them. And I'm proud to say, I mean, some of the modern uh, things that have happened to sports broadcasting, I was the initiator. For instance, in 1990, the World Cup, 
That was my idea, to make sure. That was the first time Ghana watched World Cup live. Oh, and I to see. put together the sponsors mm. to be able to finance the feed. And, mm. you know, I had to go to Jacob Echebilamte, who was head of Lentas, because <laughs> okay. I knew him politically. Mm. And, and he said, how are we going to do it? I said, we are going to have a panel discussion. Okay. They haven't done it before. I said, we'll do it this time. This is how we're going to design the set. So with Mike Amonkwafu, we designed the set. I had seen sets on ITV, on Channel 4, on BBC. So we put our heads together, and it went well at that time. My senior, Edward Fachi, hosted it. Okay. And I became a, a national figure, I would say a celebrity, very, very early when I was young. Even with the sporting end, actually. That's, right. that's, that, that's interesting. Now, you were talking about your time as general secretary. That's right. You also made the point about the very things that happens in that space. That's right. That, that time was short-lived. Very short-lived. Regrettably so. Regrettably so. It was curtailed under... I've always referred to it. It's important for Some me to Some people have never... Yeah. Not only done politics, but would have never associated themselves with the NPP again. Why? Because I felt, and the NPP is a party that I would say, together with others, although I was young, we built with our hands, yeah. right from ground up. And something that I helped to build, yeah. I would never destroy. But I'm a very firm, strong-minded character, and I want to make that clear. A lot of people know it. I've observed that press secretary to go for, and he knows my views on quite a number of things. And even as president, although you have to take instructions yeah. from him, there are times I differ respectfully oh, I yeah. on so many issues. And I knew because I was tough and I became general secretary, some people were scared. They, they thought oh, I was trying to pull the wool from under their feet. Oh, I and see. And so there was this big orchestration and conspiracy to demean me, attack me, and remove me. But I knew in my heart I had done nothing wrong. And we've been in office now for over six years. If there's any evidence, iota of evidence, of exactly what I'm supposed to have done, they should put it out. You understand? Nobody has been able to do that. And the kind of reasons that were given, they were the official ones and the, the unofficial official ones. ones. Yes. And the official ones, you know, that I refuse to respect the decision of the, the NEC. Mm -hmm. Considering the suspension of the party chairman, yeah. Paula Foko, which I said no, I didn't like it, because for a party chairman to be suspended, it has to be something serious. There has to be a grave error. Up to now, nobody can tell me exactly what Paula Foko did to be suspended as chairman of the party. The chairman is the head of the party. I remember at the time that there was even a debate about which section of the constitution uh, of the MPP a suspension of this sort would actually yes. come under. Yes, And it's true. whether I mean, or not it the procedures been invoked. That's right. Yes. The procedures yes. were never followed. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've spoken about it. And I want to sometimes, given this opportunity, to let Ghanaians know, you know, the procedures were not followed. Petitions which should be able to file at the party headquarters never came to us. And you just saw the uh, disciplinary committee invoke its own jurisdiction, which is against the MPP's own laid down rules. If there has to be an investigation or interrogation by the uh, disciplinary committee, that has to be from the steering committee. You receive it at the general secretary's office, go to steering committee, they decide, as the lawyers normally say, prima facie, mm -hmm. is there a case to answer? So maybe chairman should go and answer. Nothing like that happened. And even the constitution of the group, I've said it before, I will send you the list of those who signed it. You can't have a national executive committee meeting which is not authorized by the chairman. The chairman was in the country. Yeah. He was not the one who initiated it. Normally, you ask the general secretary to invite. But I you know that at the core of all of this is the claim that you as leaders of the party at the time were not working for the interest of the party. And that, that, that's, the the that's the funniest bit. Because you see, when you are chairman and general secretary, yeah. and you are in office, the convention is that you sit in cabinet. Yes. Why would I want to decide, deny myself an opportunity, opportunity to sit in cabinet? In cabinet? What, why? What can the NDC do for me? Which is more than what your own party... You know, so some yeah. of these things were laughable. And, you know, because those reasons... For, for I, me, for instance... Were you surprised what happened within the NPP? Because I was see, very this is surprised. a law-abiding political party. I, a political party that historically should have that posture. You know what? With what, lots of laws. What happens is that the reason why I don't want to spend too much time yeah. on these things, you know, some journalists will just pick... Oh, <laughs> a little bit of what we are saying today and make that a headline. <laughs> okay, yeah, I get And you. then you know, anybody who hasn't watched the program yes, will not see will the thing that you're in here to just take off. Right. No, so no, I, I don't want how. people to think I get that, you, I understand yeah, that part. I'm not bitter about the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, what happened was unfortunate. It should never have happened. It was against the party's own lay down rules. And in my heart, I knew I did nothing. I'm particularly impressed that 
you didn't you didn't say that that's the end of my engagement with you no you've broken trust you've broken every single believer having the structures of this party so i'll never do anything connected to it because i know in my heart that i did nothing wrong I and, 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 and my conscience is clear. I have pure motives for this party. My disappointment, I know somebody will make it a headline again, was that there were elders of this party who had worked with me from a Dubois Hennings time, mm -hmm. from a Dubois Hennings time, you know, as a young man through President Kufo. Even in 1996, mm -hmm. I was President Kufo's lead agent at the first strong woman electoral commission. The likes of Vincent Assise, yeah. Chrissy Pratt were there for the other parties, mm -hmm. you know. And in 1998, I was, I would say, the de facto campaign manager for now President Nakufa in his first presidential attempt. Yet. Yes, yet, yet. The impression was created that I don't want him you to don't be like president. The man. When I have become general secretary of the party. It's at that time rather that I don't like the man. I mean, so and it, it defies logic and common sense. But you know, in this world, propaganda and things can be orchestrated. So instead of the official uh, uh, excuses or explanation, it changed to propaganda. Yeah. My car that I, was, I had bought with my own sweat was thought to have been bought by Ibrahim Mahama. Sometimes they say it's John Mahama. Other times it's Ibrahim Mahama. It was not true. It is yeah. easy to verify. And I've said it before to some of your own colleague journalists that that's why you are there as the fourth estate of the realm. You had the opportunity to go to Sterling, go and check the receipts, the times that I paid. And there was still some outstanding. How did it happen? In, in fact, strangely, you've mentioned lawyer Kujeto again. I got a letter from his firm, not he didn't sign it, I'm okay, sorry, a yeah. junior lawyer, you know, because I think they went to audit the books of Sterling and realized I still had some little to uh, pay. outstanding to pay. They wrote to me. I, the letter is there. One of these days I will let people know. They had an outstanding payment there. Yes. That, the card they were that I've been supposedly to, giving yeah, you back. They were threatening to take me to court. Oh, I see. Yes, it's there. The, the letter is there. So all these things I kept quiet because I felt, look, this is a party in 2015 before I left. We had successfully organized parliamentary primaries. Mm -hmm. It's only about five outstanding when I left in December 2015. The presidential primaries went smoothly, although there were claims that I didn't want then candidate Akufuado to win and that I preferred Alan Chermating, which was never true. It's not true? It's not true. It's not true. I mean, look, I've been, I'm one of the closest people to. I mean, the historically, it would make sense yeah. that that's the yes, case. Yes, yes. I'm very, I'm, I'm still, I mean. But you went to join this campaign in 2020. Even in 2016, people have forgotten. Although I didn't join the campaign, I wasn't visibly seen. Mm -hmm. I supported over 100 constituencies with financial resources. Oh, I see. As a former general secretary, I felt like, look, if I wasn't going to be able to physically join the campaign because the suspension was too fresh, I would mobilize resources and support the constituencies that are deprived. And of course, if you're a general secretary, you know the deprived constituency. Yeah. So there were about 12 in Upper East, nine or so in Upper West, then Northern Region, 20, Bronhavo, 20, Ashanti, the rural Ashanti, 10, okay. and parts of Volta and Greater Accra, from my own personal resources. But yeah. did they put this out there? I, do you have to do that? We have been used to supporting this party with nothing. As a kid, you know, as a, as a young engineer, every man because they make a vacuum and people misconstrue but, your conduct. But, but officially, I wrote to the party, okay. attached all the receipts, oh, okay. the bank transfer. In fact, one of the days I was transferring the money, former minister of planning, Dr. Kutu, Ose, okay. Kutu Ose, yeah. the economist, mm -hmm. he, he bumped into me in my bank at East Legon, okay. SG Bank, and he was shocked. We, he saw the transfers going. And you wouldn't believe it. Some people are still MPs, ministers. Today, who I sent money to, who called me and said, oh, Kovna, it came in very handy because that was yeah. barely a week to elections. It was significant resources that we put together. So in 2020, when the president invited me, and he called me personally, way months before, mm. and said he wants me to be part of his campaign, true MPP person, I didn't ask any questions. I, I don't work for anything, that's not my, that's not my training. That's not how my father thought of me. That's not but how you promised to be made deputy um, chief of staff at the deputy time. Deputy chief of staff, even yeah. before it's time. He wanted me to be deputy minister. I didn't take that position, you know. I see. So I, I know the president was Not even chief of staff. No, I mean deputy no, no, minister. I'm, no, I'm talking about, I mean, because I've I, heard I, that, was, I wasn't, that you I, were promised. It uh, was all part of the things that I felt was so low. Oh, I, I, I had been with the president. Mm -hmm. I had supported him. He had won. We didn't pull any strings or 
attaching the strings to okay. my participation. Mm -hmm. I was doing it as a true party. So it was not a negotiation? No, I didn't. I don't like that. When I want to support, I support. He knows me very well. I mean, I was the one who held his hand in 1998 <laughs> yes, yes. at Osu Presbyterian Church to introduce him to the whole country as the next president of the Republic of Ghana. He knows me. I've worked for him. I don't, I don't ask for anything. He knows that. Okay. He's, he's alive. He can attest Certainly. to this. You know, so after the elections, of course, there were rumors. I'll be chief of staff. I'll be... Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. they would engineer things in the papers and say that I've not been given deputy chief of staff. I think that was trying to even wrap something in which I felt was disrespectful, you know. And again, today they'll say, we are going to VRA, the next day ECG. I if hadn't, I said, I hadn't you have asked. an appointment letter ready, then it will be switched up at the very last TV3, minute. It was even on TV3, that's yes. uh, GPH. I looked at these things, I just kept quiet. And I just said, look, just leave it. I'm a tough person. By, <laughs> by the grace of God, Interesting. I'm, I'm very tough mentally. So these mm -hmm. things, it didn't affect me at all. But I thought it was very disrespectful for people to do that to me for the work I have done for this party. I'm one of the most senior people in the party. I may be young, okay. but there's nobody in this government who was there with me and the president at, Akufu, at uh, Dubuahin's house in 1992. None of them apart from Damboche, who was a, a Dubuahin's PA. Okay. People don't know. You know. I have been there through day one, when we were stoned in Choco. How many people in this government were there? So these things, I think that uh, you, you take it on board, you are strong, you are tough, you carry on in life. I love my party, I want to serve this country, and I believe this country, and that's what drives me. Mm. That's what drives me. And that we need to let the younger generation recognize that this is a great country worth dying for. When we come back from this break, we'll be delving into that part of it. Mm. Is it really a great country worth dying for? Is this country really on the right path? What can be done differently? And of course, I am mindful of your engineering, water, sanitation, environmental background. You will fix Galamse for us today. <laughs> After this break, Kwame J. Japan. You welcome back to our front. My name is Raymond Dakwa. My guest is that wonderful engineer, Kwabunai J. Japan. And mostly, I, I got confused first. Order of the Voter, that national, highest national award, you were given one, I remember. I remember yes, that. July, it looked like the younger person with that particular award at the time, but this <laughs> changed. And you're a fellow of the Ghana Institution of Engineers and also the American... A member of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Brilliant. And, and sometimes, because of the politics leading part, we forget the other very <laughs> things Well, that I think politics took me away from my professional career Brilliant. very early. Yes. Because I've done quite a mm. lot of work. Mm. You know, as a young man, space. yeah, supervising the rehabilitation of the Kutuka International Airport, the runways, okay. in 1991, you know, when it 1991. was... 1991. 1991. <laughs> and even, even the Kumasi Airport, Limex Bao was the contractor. Oh, I see. Again, in 1991 with uh, my lecturer, Mr. Afuka. It was it used to be my lecture on transportation okay. Okay. In, uh, in, in tech. And we've done a lot of, if you go to Obuasi, there's Tiny Roland Estate. That's mm. when I had left highways. The, the, the AGC's Ag Tiny Roland? Estate, yes. Yeah, okay. a 150 unit housing project. Right from scratch, it was, it was forest. We broke ground, okay. set out the place with my colleagues, uh, architect of Sajiman and my colleague uh, from Constro Consul Limited. That's my engineering firm we set up when I, we left highways together. Mm -hmm. That was a $15 million project. We delivered within the two-year time on budget. You know, so I made a little bit of kudi, you know. <laughs> I, I, I get the point. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's, it's not from politics no, predominantly. No, no. I yes. built my house yes. before, before we, we, got, we, got, we got into power. Mm. Um, again, your, 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 your graphics guys have mixed my name. It's Ajepon, is A-G-Y-E. So if yeah. they can uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to say. Yeah, people yeah. always mi mix it up. Yeah. You know, but that's fine. All right. So uh, oh, that certainly would not be fixed anyway. <laughs> the screen I'm looking at actually has A-G-Y-E there. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, brilliant. So now, there's a point that I wanted to raise with you because we're just talking about what really happens in politics. Does this country's politics, especially of the NPP, reward loyalty, service, diligence, and the very things that astute politicians are supposed, supposed to have? No, politics is tough everywhere. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, it's not only in Ghana. I mean, mm -hmm. we can follow 
British politics, we all know yeah, what is yeah. happening mm -hmm. and in America, mm -hmm. in Germany, it's a bit, Germany is a bit more stable. Yeah. But look at Italy. Politics is tough, you know. Um, but look, my political doctrine has been based on three things. I call the triple X, service, sacrifice, selflessness. Does that pay? It should pay. And again, people should recognize that politics is about public service. Our very understanding of is that party, really what people well I think that is what days. is animating my oh, okay. my involvement in politics. I, mm -hmm. I want to do something. The little I can do um, before is I, that not an idealist before, position? It's not an idealist position. It's not at all because what I realize and what I should let people know. Okay. I've been there before. It's not as if I've not been there. Mm -hmm. I've been press secretary, rank of a minister That's for true. close to six years. You know, so all the things that politicians normally do, I could have done. I didn't do. I didn't choose to increase my, my real estate or buy, uh, go after state lands and do things like that. I, I was thankful to God that I built my own house for my sweat as a civil engineer, lived in the house in East Legon. I was given an apartment in Cantonment. I said, no, I will still continue to live there. I think it's important that we recognize. There are both for the about use. people who occupy similar positions who have actually gotten so much money within a very short period of that time. That is wrong. It's getting to a point that we should be doing personal audits in this country so that people have to tell us how much, how they came by the money that they have. Mm -hmm. Because you can't just get up and become rich overnight without telling gun, the, the authorities how you made your money. And that's the kind of thing that we would like to do eventually when I'm elected as president of this. Oh, interesting. I am. I, I'll be exploring that with you. <laughs> but before we go to that, I mean, I would not, if I don't ask this question, then I've not read your CV properly. I'm asking the question because of this particular part of the CV. That's astonishing to me. I mean, you have an MSc with extension yeah. in water yeah. and environmental engineering yeah. from the University of Surrey. Yeah. Now, in all fairness, yeah. I cannot ask you why we are having... <laughs> this endemic issue of illegal mining on our hands and what we can do about it? Well, it's all about enforcement of regulations. Enforcement of regulations and quality assurance, quality control in all aspects of our lives. Okay. It's, that is what we should be gunning for. Public servants who are working, who have been charged with the responsibility to work for this country, have to do the work and have to be held responsible. It's easy for everybody to dump it on the politicians. Mm. And I'm not saying so because I'm a politician. Yeah, yeah. I've been a public servant, yeah. worked at highways, and make sure contractors do the right thing. And I, I travel from East Legon to Kanda, where my private office is. And the, the government has done a lot of work these days. I ride on very nice asphalt okay. throughout. But I've seen the deterioration of a few portions. Mm -hmm. You see, contractors should have what we call defect liability periods. Okay. And then also, they have performance bonds. And they are engineers who should be supervising these constructions mm -hmm. and ensure that the mixed design is okay. Well, there are certain technical parameters like flow, stability, coring, and all that I used to do when I was a young mm -hmm. materials quality mm -hmm. control engineer at Ghana Highway Authority. But you see, there has to be always serious maintenance program backing the initial investment. Because if we don't have the maintenance program, when you have an intervention very quickly, you, you, you can save the situation. If you don't intervene, then you have to do major maintenance, which is a cost to the economy. So these are things that my colleagues in highways, engineers, wherever they find themselves, should be taxed to do. And I think the Minister of Roads should ensure that. It's not enough Ghana. We like doing new projects all the time. Okay. N new projects. We are very good at doing new projects. Go back and check the old ones and see whether they are being maintained or not. Go to the, some of the hospitals. And it's, it's shocking. I don't want to mention names of the hospitals. I, I, I get you. you know, so will, will we buy simple water? cleaning. Simple cleaning. Simple cleaning. We should organize. We are talking about job creation. Yeah. There should be a lot of cleaning companies in this country, cleaning the streets, cleaning the major government buildings. You know, we should let it be done so that people have jobs to do. It's what's, what's your assessment of our fight against Galamse? Who? Look, as engineers, we are results oriented. I am mission-minded mm. and results-oriented. So I don't believe in just talk. I believe in results. The last time, I think it's Joy FM. I saw yes. you with some um, samples yes. of water. Across the country. You made me, you know, goose pimples of my time as a water engineer when you have to go and take samples oh, at intake, take it to the lab and mm -hmm. check the turbidity and all the things that, you know, you have to check. And you look at it, people are calling it Milo. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, so that's the result. If you are doing it well, if the interventions are working, then you won't find those samples. It means the interventions are not working. Let's be honest with ourselves. Okay. It's, I'm an MPP person. It's a government that was birthed by the MPP, mm-hmm. although there has to be a clear distinction between government and party. Okay. And I support the, the government to do what they, they can, and they still have two years. It's a, it's a, one week in politics is a long time. Mm. So we can't pass judgment on the government right now. But I think a lot of work has to be done. It's important that drastic action is taken by the president. The buck stops at his desk. Some serious action has to be taken. Who are the regulators? Who has been issuing the permits for people to go into the forest reserves? I'm not saying forest reserves cannot be mined, but things have to be done methodically, okay. meticulously, properly, so that we know reasons why we are coming to touch the environment there. We can't continue. Look, we've had mining for over 100 years in this country. In my personal view, I am naturally, unfortunately, anti-mining because I think mining hasn't helped Africa at all. Oh, I see. Oh, yes. Um, again, if it's deep mining, maybe I'll close my eyes because it doesn't affect the environment surface, very much. Yeah. But those who are doing the surface mining, destroying, and I'm an env- environmentalist. I love the greens. If you take out any tree, you've got to replace it. Any tree you take out, you've got to replace it. And, you know, these miners go in there, dig just the surface, leave dangerous traps that can drown young children, but as part of their contracts, they are supposed to do restoration of any place they touch. Because before you do any mining, you have to clear what we call the vegetative yes, cover, yes, yes. the agricultural land and pile it. Mm-hmm. It's all part of the project, the project management. Who is in charge of that? The engineers, the mining engineers, the, the, the technocrats at the ministries, the mineral commission. We have people who are being paid to do this work. And now we are going about blaming chiefs. The chiefs don't issue permits. Of course. They don't issue permits. So they should be the last people for us to blame. You understand? Of course, they, 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 they have moral authority and they, have, uh, they, they control the land. the land. They have yeah. the custodians of the land. So, you know, they can play a major role in helping the situation. But right now, we as Ghanaians too should be looking at ourselves. The young people who think that they are looking at their individual interests. So let's go into this area. There's, there's gold in my area. Let's destroy the area so that I can make some money. That attitude should stop. The individualism in this country is too much. We are gripped with that, chasing after material things, chasing after money. You don't need that much money to survive. Really? You don't. I've been ostracized for seven years. I'm here. I'm, here. I'm not dead. I'm not dead yet. You are, you know? You're not jobless for seven years. Well, you actually I was, I was when I was well, on suspension. Oh, yeah, I couldn't, for I couldn't time do out. any to work. Fair, yes. And yeah. I had to wait mm. for my tenure to finish mm-hmm. before I wrote to the party and said, look, my tenure is over. And so... Because as a general secretary, you are a full-time employee of the party. You are supposed to be paid your salary. When I talk about this, then it will become a headline that uh, <laughs> Komnai Japan says he wasn't paid anything and that kind of stuff. But that's a fact. I wrote to the party, mm-hmm. documenting all the support I had given to the party, although I was on suspension, all the money I had spent on my own to support. Even when you're not being paid? Yes. Now, you know, just... in fact, the unfortunate thing is, even my personal things that I left in the office, I haven't received them up to today. But I'm not making any issue out of it. I, I, I I'm very fine. I don't want any journalist tomorrow to make it a headline. <laughs> <laughs> you Would know, you? So, you know, so I think that as a country, you talked about a country. The politics yeah. of this country has to shift. Like it, it has to change. Into what it has to look right now, there's a need for a new era, mm-hmm. a new dawn, a new dimension, okay. and a new direction. People should understand that you go into politics to serve. To improve the lives of Ghanaians. Not to amass to, wealth. Not to amass wealth. The understanding and the belief of the general population is that mm-hmm. politics has become a meal ticket. Yeah. That is wrong. That has to stop. I, that's why I encourage young people, have a career. If I didn't have a career, after I was thrown out as general secretary, I would have had nothing to do. That's true. But I went back. I was chief executive of the Ghana Institution of Engineering mm-hmm. and also honorary uh, General Secretary of the West African Federation of Engineering Organization, a position I still hold on, but because of my politics, politics I've told the course. board that I have to yeah. um, relinquish that. You know, so it is important as a people, both political parties, and that's why I said this to the NDC. When I hear of Uswampofu say to people that uh, in, in local palace, Mohamed yeah. Boa, Ikwai, Uni, what's the meaning of that? They say it's no contribution, no chop. Why should 
chop. What are you going to chop? You are going into government to run the government to build the country, not to go and chop. That mentality should disappear. So it's a mentality. It's a that mentality thing. We and actually would take rather than give. That's right. And that's not how we started our party. When we started, everybody was giving. People were selling their houses. The likes of Kwesi Lamte, Jay Addison, uh, Jemfi Bikai, many, too many. Uh, Dombo, Moro Salifu, Ishaku, Inwa, a lot of people. I can't even mention uh, Tommy Ametopo, Involta, AK Deku. Uh, I can't mention all of them. You understand? Stephen Keku, you know, people were prepared to even sell their houses to support the, the MPP. Now it, it has changed. changed. You want somebody to go and fix a, a, a poster, poster, they want money. That, that is the reason why I am running, to elevate the discourse, to bring the values back for Ghanaians to realize that we have a country to love. We have to love our, ourselves. You know, so we can't have political leaders singing this song that if you don't contribute, you won't chop. That is very bad coming from the NDC chairman. And I think that it has to be repudiated. You can't do that. Political parties, governance is about the centrality and the welfare of the Ghanaian, everybody, especially the underprivileged, the underserved populations. And those should be our target. I need to ask you this question. You talked about lifestyle audits being a part of what you would introduce if you're president today. That's right. What else will make you stand out if you're president today? I think my views have been very clear. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be very decisive. I will operate a very small government. I've always believed in that. It's not because of now. I think the cabinet, the, the constitution gives 19. us 19. Yeah. I think we can operate with less than that okay. in this country. And there should be one deputy minister to every minister. Okay. The president has one vice president. Mm -hmm. So I don't see why ministers, in certain ministries, you have about three, four deputy ministers. Okay. I don't see why fisheries and uh, aquaculture should be outside agriculture. Mm. And I quite remember, even as press secretary, I, I was looking at President Kufo with a, with a look <laughs> when he was t taking ports and harbors and uh, yeah. uh, aviation out of transport. As a civil engineer, we know transport is everything. Oh, everything um, yeah. The one that we normally allow to be taken out is roads because okay. it's so it's crucial so huge, yeah. to the, the, the development of a young country like Ghana. So my views have been known. I mean, there are videos on YouTube, um, interviews in 2015 when I was general secretary. And I said this. I'm not saying this now because I'm throwing my hat in the ring. It's, it's, it's the, the transformation of the country and the Ghanaian that matters to me more than me becoming the president. If somebody else can do it, I'll help him do it. Okay. So far, I don't seem to hear that anybody has a platform like mine. And I want you to be asking the so-called favorites, what do they have to contribute? What are they going to do? You understand? I have told you a few things. I have told you a few things. Those I, ones. I have some very radical changes that have to be made. So, for instance, the, the, yeah. the, the procurement authority. I think it should disappear from the face of the air. Really? What EPA? Does it, what, what does it do? What, it helps what, stimulate procurement. Has it? Has it? Well, with some difficulty, has it? really. Has it? <laughs> it's you obviously know, problematic. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I think every entity should do their own procurement. Okay. Because if you are in Kolebu teaching hospital, and you are procuring medical equipment, you need biomedical engineers and doctors. They know what they want to procure. If you are in Ghana highways and doing procurement for bridges and all that, engineers will do that. And there are quantities of ways to support that. Now, all of a sudden, as Gracia, I think, and I've said it, I want to repeat it, as Gracia should be like a parachute payment. You know, when you have served your country like a member of parliament, it's a difficult assignment. Okay. And then I, I would say it's like marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, when you elevate a lady to a certain level, yes. you know, as your wife, and you want to leave her, that's why they let you pay alimony. Yes. You have to support her. <laughs> yes. You know, you sure. can't allow her just to drop because okay. you are leaving. Mm -hmm. That's not right. It's not fair. So you make somebody an honorable member of parliament, he served. When he's going home, you know, something little maybe can take the after car away. four years? Or not after every four years. I time. never understood that. If you are coming back, it cannot be as gracia. So... I see the speaker and the likes of Chairman, they must have benefited a lot. My good friend Katie Amon. Uh, every, More than six times. That is not right. It cannot be right. You know, on any moral standing, it cannot be right. We should stop it immediately. We don't have the money as a country. These views, are they, are they popular within your party? It doesn't have to be. If I remain the only man standing in this whole country, and I believe in those views, I don't mind. 
I don't mind. I'm not a populist at all. I mean, some of the views I know people don't like, but that's mm -hmm. quite a nice point for you. Because I don't think it makes, uh, they don't think it makes for good politics. What is good politics? To them, good, good politics is serving the nation. I don't want yeah. to be politically correct. Okay. I don't like that at all. Of course, you have to be measured. You have to be moderate. There are things you don't have to say. We all know that. There are, there are a lot of things that I can say, but I don't say it. Okay. Because of the love I have for my party. I've been press secretary to the president. I've been general yeah. secretary. I have, my head has, has a lot of information about what goes on in this country and our party. Some of it, you die with it. You understand? We are soon engaging the IMF. Hmm. You want to go to go the economics? Yeah, just briefly. I, 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 I have an issue with how we have run the economy of this country. Not right now, from time immemorial. Mm. We tend to think the IMF or the Western people, they are not the ones going to save this country. Okay. They are not the ones. That, anytime we tend to them, I feel sad and worried that we are having to tend to them. They don't mean well for us. What's your why, why? Look at uh, You think Bill Gates... And the last time I had Warren Buffett yeah. was, was giving Bill Gates, what, 35 billion That's to true. come to Africa? To, why? They are, they, are, they, are, they are homeless people in America. Why is he not doing that? We have to ask them what is really behind it. I, I don't completely trust these things. You know? Okay. So we as a, as, a, as a people have to take our destiny into our own hands. Look, I simplify economics into two things. Incoming, which is what the economists say, revenue, your expenditure. As a human being, you have to earn enough to support how you live. We have a country where now our budget has a big deficit, and we're always looking outside. We have to be upfront with Ghanaians. I've said this last week. Upfront, bold. If indeed, look, we've done a lot of roadworks in these last six years. If we have to tell the Ghanaian people that we're not going to do any new projects and do maintenance, let's be upfront and tell them. This is how much money we can generate. And then we have to have an aggressive generation of money, which means tighten the screws at the term apart. It's leaking like a basket. And we know the collusion and the, the kinds of money that the nation is losing. And then the waivers that we are giving to companies. And, you know, the amount of money that we are waving to mining companies. And we, 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 a lot. we should do this conversation again, again. because they say my time is up, which is oh, really what I'm very up. sad about. <laughs> but many thanks to you, sir. Folks, that's where we end today's edition of Upfront. Many thanks to you for watching.